Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Micah Mortali, and he's talking about his book. Please hold it up. Please present your work. Rewilding Practices and Skills for Awakening in Nature. Welcome. Whoa. <laughs> Thanks, CJ. Oh, man, I knocked my, got so excited there. I knocked my phone off my stand. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's great <laughs> to have you here. So, um, you you hail from um, Criplu um, School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership. Um, you were the founder of that school. You're now directing the education and programming. Tell me what that's all about. What kind of stuff does the um, um, Kripalu uh, group do and what kind of stuff? What is the Mindful Outdoor Leadership program all about? Yeah, so um, Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health is the largest yoga retreat center in North America. So we're located in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts, uh, which are uh, part of the Appalachian mountain chain. And, um, you know, we have anywhere between like 35 and 40,000 people a year who come wow. to the center. Um, the Kripalu schools are uh, one of the uh, oldest, um, longest running yoga schools in America. So I think our first yoga teacher training was uh, in the mid, mid seventies. So uh, in 2018, I founded the Kripalu School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership um, as a response to um, sort of what I was seeing in the world. Um, I was very inspired by Richard Louv's work. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Last Child in the Woods, mm -hmm. Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Um, I was a new dad at the time and uh, somebody who has always gone uh, into the forests and into uh, wild places for healing and inspiration and to deepen my spiritual practice. So um, I was noticing by you know being someone who's deeply immersed in um, the mindfulness and yoga world that um, you know this world that I'm immersed in is in many ways like just as nature deprived as the rest of modern society. You know, most yoga classes, meditation courses, centers, you know, really conduct a, almost 100% of their activities and classes indoors, mm -hmm. um, which is ironic, I think, because um, surely most of the great mystical traditions of the world came from people deeply immersed in wild, natural places and environments and were taught by nature. So the School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership is about getting back to our roots. It's about getting outside, getting outdoors, uh, coming into the present moment, and um, we train people to be mindful outdoor guides. So they are uh, ambassadors between people and place, um, inviting folks into a mindful state to reconnect and reopen a conversation with the living earth. Um, so, yeah, that's what it's all about. Okay. Now I have like another hundred questions to <laughs> ask you. <laughs> all right. So I wanted to go back to you. It said that when you were younger, um, that you went into nature for, for healing. What did that look like? I mean, what, what, how did you use nature for healing? Uh, well, I think, you know, when I was little, my folks, uh, built a house in the, in the woods, uh, that was off the grid for a time when I was real little. So, uh, we didn't have electricity and, um, you know, we had a pump well and, you know, I, those experiences were very formative for me. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, after my folks divorced when I was little, um, and I, you know, I had a lot of time where I was alone actually as a little kid where I was unsupervised and alone. And so, um, I, I just found myself, um, uh, with time and with space and unstructured time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had, um, lots and lots of land to roam and explore. And so, um, you know, I would just be out there. Um, I would, you know, have my bow and arrow with me and, you know, and I'd be running around in the woods, like climbing trees and, um, you know, um, making little boats and sending them down the streams and, um, just being, you know, being free. And, um, as I grew up and got a little bit older, um, you know, but even as a child, I, I was curious about God, I think as a little kid, you know? And so when I would be out there, um, you know, I would be, um, very captivated by, what I would see out there, you know, the wind and the trees and the animals. And, um, it just felt very, uh, sacred to me, I think as a little kid. And, you know, I also went to church and so I would kind of, I was curious about the juxtaposition between the kind of sacredness I felt in a, a man-made space like a church and then how, when I, and then going outside and the difference. And as I got older, 
I just found that my sense of the sacred was, was nourished more and more and more um, out in the woods. And so I was just called to get out there um, as much as I could. So what do you think is happening? Because you were, you were curious when you were younger, um, and I'm sure that's been developing over time, the intersection between um, the sacredness of the church and being outdoors. I mean, you've been doing this for a while. What do you see as the intersection between those two things? Well, um, what I find is that um, when I'm outside and I'm actually present for what's happening, um, everything feels like a miracle. Mm. And I think what what I my experience was at times was reading stories um, from biblical times was that miracles were um, these rare events. Mm. And, um, and so I, I, I think I felt the sadness that, that, um, oh, there weren't miracles anymore, you know, or where were the miracles? And, um, what, what I, what I discovered was that, um, the more time I spent becoming still and present, um, out on the land, uh, the more awe that I felt for all of creation and that like everything felt like a miracle. And I think that that's what I love so much about, um, what I do is that uh, to see folks that um, we get to, you know, bring out on our in our trainings and expeditions um, begin to make that transition from, you know, coming in and, and, and seeing a lot of things as profane or just seeing a tree. Oh, that's an oak tree or, oh, that's a rock. Um, and through the course of a few days, um, those trees and rocks are no longer just trees and rocks. They're animate presences and beings, um, each one unique, each one speaking in its own language, in its own way. Um, and I, I think that that shift in awareness is really needed right now. Um, yeah. How come? Because um, I think that modern society has um, really objectified the earth and you know we we've um we've deanimated our world mm. uh, um and i think that in doing that we've also uh, deanimated ourselves and one another um and i think that there's a, a a real loss um of the sacred and of a sense of connection and um interdependency that is the reality of our existence and that um as a as a global community, we're 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 in a process of awakening to that reality that we're interdependent upon one another, and um, you know, like you know, many of the um, indigenous people on this planet, you know, have been trying to say for a long time, you know, that um, you know we can't pollute the water and the air, or, you know, eradicate other species without you know, in some ways, like eradicating and harming ourselves, and I think that um, more and more people are waking up to that now. Mm -hmm. So um, you had talked that the, your motivation for writing this book was as a dad, and you'd read Lost Child in the Woods, and um, you mentioned yourself the time and space and unstructured time was really critical for your own personal um, understanding, it sounds like, of the world, right, and the sacredness mm -hmm. and magic of the world. Um, what is it like as a dad now as you share that same experience that your parents shared with you? Yeah, so I think um, it, for it, what's amazing is, um, well, I'd say like one thing we've done is we've made the decision to like not overstructure the kids' time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, after school, you know, our kids, you know, we don't have them doing a lot of activities. So one of the things that my wife and I both felt was that like we wanted our kids to get bored. And, Wait, how old uh, are your kids, just out of curiosity? Well, they're seven and nine right now. Mm -hmm. um, I have a stepdaughter who's 16 as well, and, okay. and she's a real athlete. Um, but the, the, my youngest um, son and daughter are, uh, they're seven and nine, and, um, you know, actually they're, you know, we've decided to put them in a, um, they're in a Waldorf school, actually, mm -hmm. where, you know, they can get lots of outdoor time. And, and uh, we've also really tried to um, re minimize any kind of, like, screen use with mm -hmm. the kids as well. So, mm -hmm. um you know, we're, 
and every, you know, one thing I'll say is that, you know, I know everybody's doing their best to raise their kids. So um, I try not to be, you know, I'm not come, I'm trying not to be too preachy about all this. You know, this is what works for us. Um, but, you know, the average American child is, you know, last um, report that I read is, you know, on a screen seven or eight hours a day outside of school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a shocking amount of time. Seven to eight hours a day? Outside of school. Really? Okay. I don't know. I have my, my children are now uh, 18 and 20. And so at the time, the internet was still very popular, but our kids were not on the screen yeah. time. Like I was having nervousness when they got more than an hour and a half and think, and like, oh my gosh, yeah. I'm being, you know, I can't, I have to keep my, you know, so it's seven to eight is yeah. a huge Delta from 20 years ago. Okay, it's so a huge, it's huge. And the average American is 11 hours a day. Yeah, well, because they're at work, right? I mean, eight yeah. hours of my yeah. work day is yeah. probably on the computer. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about nature deficit disorder, and I think every time I turn around, someone is either claiming that they have attention deficit order or something of the like. How do you see those two? Uh, and I think Lost Child in the Woods talks a lot about that, but how do you see the two in your own experience with your own children and other children? Yeah, yeah well, um, you know, Nature deficit disorder, um, one of the symptoms of it, and it's not a medical diagnosis, it's more of a kind of an uh, observation of a so sociological perhaps phenomenon, um, is attention difficulties. And that's one thing Louvre writes about is just uh, folks struggling um, to hold their attention. You know, we know that the attention span has been decreasing uh, for some time. And um, in my research, I came upon. Um, some environmental psychologists, the Kaplans, um, who have a theory that which they call attention restoration theory. Hmm. Um, and essentially what, you know, what they say is that, um, when we try to hold our attention for prolonged periods of time on a single thing, um, like what we do when we're writing emails or, you know, trying to manage our outlook calendar or something along those lines or sitting in a meeting, um, we have to inhibit a lot of other things that are calling for our attention. Mm. And it's that effort to inhibit other stimuli that over time cause a fatigue in the brain mm. and cause us to get what they call uh, directed attention fatigue. Mm. Um, and interestingly, the antidote for directed attention fatigue is what they call um, fascination attention. Mm. And fascination attention is basically how you feel when you look out a window at a green space. So fascination attention is um, the brain on nature. Mm. It's when we're walking in the woods or we're at the beach and, and we're just allowing our senses to just take in our environment and we're hearing the sound of the waves or we're feeling the wind on our skin or, you know, maybe we hear, you know, a seagull and we look up and then we see some crabs and, you know, then we feel the sand between our toes and mm. it's just, I'm in the moment and I'm in my natural environment and I'm fascinated with what's happening. I'm not, I'm not trying to hold my focus on anything. I'm just fascinated. And, you know, my feeling about, um, you know, attention deficit disorder. And, and again, I'm not, um, you know, I don't have kids who've been diagnosed with that. And so I don't want to come across as judging parents who have. Um, but one of the challenges I think for kids today is, um, that, you know, most kids are not spending a lot of time outside anymore. Mm -hmm. And when they're in school, you know, and they're sitting at a desk and they're having to direct their attention for long periods of time, and then they're spending less and less time outside where fascination attention can restore them, it makes sense to me that kids would really be struggling with their attention because, to be honest, the way I look at it, CJ, is that modern kids most and modern adults as well have been removed from their natural habitat. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if we think of ourselves as an animal species, which we are, mm -hmm. if you take a wild creature and you put them in an artificial environment, um, there's probably going to be uh, some struggles. Mm. And I think modern humans have largely been taken out of our natural habitat, which mm. is, you know, for lack of a better word, nature. Mm. Um, and so a lot of the challenges I think are partially as a result of that. Mm. So, um, I'm, when you were talking about fascination attention, I was thinking about my own children 
who didn't really want to go outdoors despite trying to drag them outdoors several times for walks or whatever. They just mm -hmm. really did not want to. Um, and I could have forced them to, which I did on occasion. Um, but it's the, what I'm noticing about kids this age nowadays of this time, teenagers now, so now I'm fast forwarding to teenagers, their fascination attention goes to computer games um, mm -hmm. or, you know, or um, where you're running outside in a computer game or you're watching Netflix where you're watching Fast and Furious. So there's there's a fascination attention that's maybe not natural or oriented, but it seems like that is the way that youth today basically or YouTube videos like they have to concentrate at school and typing and focusing. And, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff nowadays when you go to. Um, college is my kids on the computer at college focusing on the lecture taking notes you know doing all these different things and going to the library and writing and reading and so it's like it's that directed attention fatigue that he's getting and then you know it's by the time it's you know 12 midnight after studying going to classes he's not going to take a walk out in nature um, so he may actually watch Netflix. You mm -hmm. know, those are, mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the reality of today's yeah. youth, and which is unfortunate. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering whether that's the fascination attention, how people are coping with it now. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's uh, very true. Um, you know, the, the difference, I think, is that um, when we're, you know, when we allow ourselves to go and have unstructured time outdoors, um, our senses are stimulated and our nervous system is activated in a way that doesn't happen when we're uh, watching a movie. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the aroma of the forest, um, the essential oil secreted by the trees, um, we co-evolved with them. Mm -hmm. So um, those aromas, those smells, um, the presence of other life forms um, stimulate our senses um, actually help us shift into a parasympathetic nervous system state. Mm. Um, so out of a fight or flight state and into a rest, relax, digest state, just by taking like a short walk out in nature, we'll do that for the nervous system. Um, it'll also stimulate all of our other senses as well, our hearing, our sight, our tactile senses, our smell, sense of smell. Um, and, you know, these are these are experiences that you don't get, um, you know, watching TV. And I think also, um, there is a, um, there's a sense of connection to, to, um, the life force of the planet. Um, the fact that, you know, plants, animals, um, the, the ecosystems around us are teeming with living things. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're near them, um, that has a subtler effect on our awareness and our consciousness. Um, and we, we receive a sense of not being alone, not being isolated mm -hmm. um, out there in the community of living things. Mm -hmm. um, that's very important, I think. And, and one of the uh, reasons why I wrote Rewilding and, and founded the school was that, you know, children growing up today, you know, if they're not having experiences of deeply bonding and connecting with their local environments, how will they advocate on behalf of them as adults, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I think those bonding experiences are vital to the future, mm. that children love their lands, know their lands. And so what we train folks in the school to do is actually um, really become students of their local environments mm. um, because we want folks to be bonded to their local lands, mm -hmm. um, know the animals that live there, know the trees, know the plants, know the invasive species, know the challenges, know the watershed, um, be students of all that there is to learn from the land that you live on so that um, through mindfulness, we can really become the caretakers, the stewards um, that I think that we're called to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a, yeah. a, a question to ask you. So there's Two, I'm, I was wondering if you could guide us through two potential meditations. One, one we can do at our desk, when unfortunately we can't necessarily get like all the five sensories of like outdoors 
like maybe you can put a you know a little mist of like you know okay well here's patchouli you know uh-huh. <laughs> that's what yeah. I do lavender frankincense and blue camille here you there go you CJ go. like that's better <laughs> than nothing <laughs> sure okay what I'm doing for people who are listening I have a little spray a bottle with these essences in yes, there yes yes or a candle so you know we're at our desk and we have uh, directed attention fatigue from writing emails writing report. Um, can you step us with through, you know, a quick thing that we could do to just take a break from it all? And then, um, yes, yeah, so let's do that. And then I have another right. request for you. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, is there a window at the desk? Um, let's assume that you're in one of those millennial farms um, where there's. <laughs> okay. Oh, I think it's called WeWorks. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> I call it a, I think of it being a millennial farm where you have yeah. like a stall. You have yeah. like some wood paneling maybe but there's not a okay. lot of nature you're in a cubicle okay. cubicle. In a cubicle got it okay well i guess first thing that i would offer is that um if you are at a workstation that does have a window mm-hmm. to turn and face the window let your eyes be relaxed and open okay. and allow your attention to just gaze out of the window okay i'm gonna do okay. that now i'm turning my face because okay. i have a window outside. okay so i'm gonna gaze right. out the window i'm just gonna gaze out the window and then i'd invite you to begin to slowly deepen your breath Breathing in, just feeling the breath flowing in, and then breathing out through the mouth, letting that exhale be twice as long as the inhale. And again, breathing in, feeling the breath moving into your lungs, and letting that exhale be long, smooth, and complete. And what if I'm not, just for those people who don't have the joy yeah. of seeing outside, should I be looking at a picture? What should I be doing? Yeah, yeah. So if you don't have a window, then I'd invite you to close your eyes and focus on the breath flowing in okay. and flowing out. Okay? And the key to this practice is letting your exhale be twice as long as the inhale. And that's going to trigger the relaxation response. And as you breathe in, Inviting a sense of gratitude for the gift of this breath. And as you exhale, letting go of any tension or tightness or stress you might be holding in your mind, your body, and your heart. And as you breathe, knowing that you're connecting with the element of air, which is always moving. And this air that you're breathing in is the exhalation of the trees and the oceans. And knowing that as you exhale, you're providing an in-breath for the trees. Breathing in, breathing out, aware of your sense of interdependence with all life on the planet. Knowing as well that this breath that you're breathing in right now was probably on the other side of the earth just three or four days ago. And that this breath that we're breathing in has been recycled on this planet for at least a few billion years. And just remembering that at any point in your day, you can come back to your breath and reconnect with this body, which is a manifestation of the living earth. That there is no separation between you, your body, and nature. You are a self-aware expression of life on this planet. And one more big breath in. And then a big sigh as you let it go. I'm just taking a moment to notice if you feel any different, if anything shifted. It has shifted. I'm wondering what, um, and I can't explain the nature of this, and I'm sure you can because you've seen it happen before. There, I'm looking outside, and if, I were, and if you were to look at, I'm in Seattle, so I'm looking outside. It's a gray day, and I have a bunch of... Um, ferns that are outside mm-hmm. that are growing and so I was looking at the ferns as I was breathing in and out and so I did some of the things that you mentioned the connection the, the wording itself thinking about the connection to the plants and that I'm part of nature help facilitate that kind of connection 
but I do feel a qualitative difference between when I'm breathing in and out with my eyes closed and when I have my eyes open. And I'm not sure if it's the thing that you mentioned that like I have five sensories, I, I, my five <coughs> senses are awakened. What do you think is like even just a simple having a picture or like looking out the window and finding a live object? Um, is it the connection to the life force? Is it the sensory piece? Um, what is it about looking out the window like that that provides that sense of more of a different kind of grounding than when I close my eyes and do it? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, CJ. And I, th I think that um, the open eyed meditation is really great for helping to increase a feeling of connection with the world around you. Mm -hmm. I think when we close our eyes and go inside in meditation, there's almost a disembodied feeling mm -hmm. with that sometimes where we're very much and you, you can certainly do that and connect to the body. But I think when we draw the senses inward in yoga or in meditation, um, the purpose of that really in classical yoga is to begin to um, almost distill consciousness apart from nature and the body and the gross aspects of humanity. It's like the ancient yogis were trying to distill down to the causal reality, getting down to the point of consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, what we're trying to do in the school is like, there's just different paths. Right. And, and we've customized um, the open-eyed meditations because we know that it helps to foster a greater sense of embodiment and connection with nature. We're not trying to draw away from nature. Uh, okay, got it. And so Kelly, yeah. um, one of our listeners wrote back, um, and, and follow up to that question, is it better to have an open or closed eyes then? Is it, um, you know, based on what you just said, like if you want a connection to nature or what you're saying, yeah. in yoga class, it's like to like distill it down into being embodied versus when you close your eyes, you're not embodied. But then for some people, sometimes opening their eyes is like too much stimulation. So it means that eyes are yeah. closed. So is there a better or worse open no. or closed? I wouldn't say one's better or worse. Um, you know, sometimes the senses can become overstimulated. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, you know, if you've been on a screen for hours and hours a day, or if you've been in a, you may be at a mall or a casino or something. And, you know, I, I know we all probably have those moments where we get home and we're just, you know, we've been overwhelmed, our senses have been overwhelmed, you know, in Ayurveda, the understanding is that the eyes are actually digesting all this information that's coming in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes closing our eyes and going inward is a beautiful way to rest the senses. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's why around the holidays, around the winter solstice right now, it's such a beautiful practice to, you know, turn the lights down low, you know, let it be quiet because nature is tends to be more quiet, darker, more serene right now. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not better or worse. It's just what do you need to find balance? You know, what's going to help you feel the most relaxed or the most connected? So sometimes closing the eyes and drawing inward like nature is doing right now is, is, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on, on what you need and what kind of connection is appropriate in the moment. Yeah, so I'm so when you're talking about in the moment right now, you're talking about winter, right? Where it's like shorter days, it's mm -hmm. darker. There's a sense of it, there's a weird sense. If I focus on nature, everything is kind of quiet and slow. If I go to a mall, it's like the complete opposite. <laughs> so there's like this 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 intersection between what's happening when I put myself out into you know the man created world. And then when I went and when I look at what's happening in nature, everything like all the leaves have fallen down. It's a sense of quiet and peace and rest, mm -hmm. but it feels so dissonant with what's happening. You know, I go to a holiday yeah. party. You know. So yeah. what what to do? I mean, how how does one think about that dichotomy? Yeah, well, um, you know, all the celebrations are wonderful. You know, and the lights and you know, there's so much um, good. You know, this time of year, and it goes back a long time of people. Um, you know, wanting to um, keep the flame lit in, as we head into the dark of winter. Um, but I think that uh, in some ways, you know, and, and Charles Schultz probably talked about this in the 60s with the Charlie Brown special, you know, maybe we've, we've over-commercialized the season a bit. You know, maybe we've, we've brought a little, much too, little too much light right. to this time of year, right? right. <laughs> it's like, um, where's the peace? 
you know, where we, you know, you see, you, you hear about peace at this time of year, but you know, when I look around, I see a lot of folks who don't seem like they're feeling peaceful, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that, um, for me, um, you know, I, I try to turn to the land and uh, see what it's offering. And so, you know, last weekend, my wife and I were going to head to the mall to do some shopping. And I was excited. I was like, oh, there's going to be bells. It's going to be festive. And, and then, you know, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to, I think my son and I, we're going to stay home. We're going to go in the woods. And so she went and we, um, we went for a walk in the woods and we made a little fire and we boiled some water and we made peppermint tea oh, sweet. and we were alone and the snow was falling and we were, we sang a couple old Christmas carols. And then we, um, whispered some of our Christmas wishes, like into a hollow maple tree, oh, you know? Beautiful. And I told them like, you know, this is how we tell the forest what our wishes are. And we were just, it was whimsical. But for me, it was, uh, wonderful because I was really needing to connect with the spirit of this time of year. Mm. And that's what it looked like for us on that day. And I, I'd, l- I'd really love to, you know, invite people to think about um, less is more, you know, whatever that might mean for you. Um, because this time of year is very profound. If you go out and you don't have to be in a wild place, you know, if you just go to a park or someplace, um, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and just like, just pay attention to the light toward the end of the day. And just notice movement and the quality of the land. Um, there's a profound message in this time of year, mm. um, and we don't really have to do too much, but just to be present for it and pay attention. Mm-hmm. So even like if you are at your desk all day and you need to get lunch, which is it's normally like this: I need to go get lunch. Dee, 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 thinking about all the work tasks and what I do when I get back. Yeah. Which is a completely different experience, and perhaps I don't know. What do you do when you need, when you're walking outside in between, you know, in between work and the next thing? Is there some way to, you know, you only ha- you maybe have a five minute time to go out to lunch. You get on if you're in an urban environment, you get on the elevator, you go down, you're in a building, you leave the building, you run into another building to get lunch. What's a different way of experiencing that time? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the breath is the key wherever you are. I think it always comes back to the breath. At least it does for me. Mm-hmm. Um, just take a moment, you know, give yourself the gift of a moment as you step outside. Just even if, even if everybody else is moving quickly, you know, invite a deep breath in. And as you exhale, just pause and, and, and just look around and maybe look up at the sky And, um, you know, if you have a place near where you work, where there is a tree or some place where there's a little bit of nature, like some plants, you know, um, you do not need to spend a lot of time there. One minute just breathing and listening to the sound of the wind and noticing what birds are around, you know, um, can have a profound effect. Mm. Um, So no matter what, you know, the, um, the long exhale is a powerful tool. Mm. You know, invite a breath in through your nose and then just lengthen out that exhale and pause. Mm. Okay. So I have a, a whole nother set of questions that have are okay. uh, born out of an experience that I had recently. So, um, I, um, did the Camino, which is one of the th- three sacred pilgrimages that people do. It's a for me, it was a 30-day walk through nature, and um, I did it primarily as a way of healing, not knowing exactly how the healing would occur or what would occur at all. Um, and in the Camino, you basically walk along for 500 miles, and all you're doing is following big yellow arrow signs, and it's the epitome of time, um, unstructured time. Um, and space and because everything is just you know you're walking through big the mountains or you're walking through um, f- large fields that go on forever or sky that just goes on forever because it's the countryside of Spain and um, and I can't people try to say to me they, they said what was the Camino like and I'm like great like I'm trying to <laughs> like I'm, <laughs> it's it's so I I'm having a hard time articulating um what nature taught me i i 
think. So I wanted to share with you my experience and maybe get your experiences since you've had a lot more um, time with nature and have been thinking about the intersection of the sacredness of nature and ourselves. But for me, in some ways, I can't tell how I was taught by nature, but I, so I was, um, I'm now empty nesting. And so I shipped my son off to college. Mm. And um, I, I, I know when I shipped my first son off to college, it was very, very hard. And I, I had a lot of grief of which I don't even know if I fully processed. And I thought now that my second child, and I'm very, very close to my sons and my family and being a mother, very identified with being a mom. So I thought, well, when, when I ship my last child and we're empty nesting, um, I'm going to go for this long walk. And I don't know what will happen, but I hope, you know, transformation will occur. And when, that, when, I was d when I was walking, it was interesting. There are times when I just had these heaving cries, and I don't know what it was. I'm not sure what uh, the content was unclear. I just know that incredible grief was happening. And it felt like a tree in fall when the leaf just falls and it's just a natural expression of what nature wants to do but i can't explain what nature taught me i think that's what it is and i can't even explain what happened but i came back in a very uh, not grieving anymore i mean grief i mean miss my kids but not that deep sense of grief that i had with my first child and now that i'm empty nesting didn't have so what do you think nature is teaching us when we go out and put ourselves in that experience. Just exactly what we need to know. And it's, um, but I would say to you, that um, it's okay to not be able to articulate that yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, not to try maybe, um, you know, I think, it's, I think sometimes it's easy to want to just understand an experience yeah. cognitively. Um, but I think sometimes it's not always like the learning isn't always that, um, you know, and I would even say like, um, you know, sometimes experiences like that take many, many years to digest. Wow. Like many years. And I, I guess what I, because we, um, when, when we're in, uh, when we're in the forest for these nine day immersive trainings with our mindful outdoor guides, um, we go through like a process of, um, opening up to the experience mm -hmm. and the depth of life as a human being on this planet. And, um, that process of opening up to that mystery um, is very unique to each person hmm. and doesn't hmm. always make sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah. Um, and is, and is very, um, personal mm -hmm. and, and, um, and very sacred. And so sometimes, um, your story around that experience is something that I would encourage you to like protect Hmm. And, 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 and actually, um, I would encourage you, um, if I were going to say anything, just to keep walking, mm -hmm. you know, and see if you can walk it into yourself, like just rather than write it or talk about it, like walk it, keep walking that experience. Um, what does that mean? Walking into myself? I'm just, I'm trying to visualize. I'm, and actually I have stopped. It was two months ago and I'm still walking yeah. except that I just, busted my ankle from two months ago. I probably put oh. in a thousand miles on my ankle. <laughs> my ankle's it's like, no, CJ, yeah. you must stop. So okay. I've, I've taken a three week respite, but maybe I can actually experience in my short walks to, you know, the get coffee. Yeah. Um, well, you know, for somebody like, for folks like us, CJ, who, um, you know, we're sometimes if like you're, you're in the business of kind of teaching or talking or sharing or, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I had an experience years ago where, um, which I didn't talk about for a long time, but I had an experience where I was meditating in the forest and a black bear came down and sat right next to me, like wow. two feet away from me in the forest. And it was just the most 
profound experience. Like, mm. and, and, uh, I held it very close for a really long time. Mm. Um, and I wrote about it in the book after about 10 years, like after the experience, you know, because, um, it's, it's a story. It's something I can share with the world. It's, it, it's what I have to offer, but it took me like a really long time to get to the point where I felt ready to like, talk about that and share it. Um, and, you know, these days with social media, it's like everything's public, you know, and I think sometimes we rush to package up our experiences, you know, and um, I've always dreamed of doing the, the, the walk that you just described. And so I'm just yeah. like, you know, deep bow to you for that. And <laughs> it's, it just, it's, it sounds like a profound experience. Um, and I would just hold it, hold it close and um, honor that, honor your process. Um, yeah. It, and it is interesting because I've talked to you. So the things that you mentioned that it's very unique to each person, because I've talked to people who've gone on the Camino three years ago, a year ago, a month ago, and, and even how they undertake the Camino, did they walk it alone, which I did for the vast majority of it, you know, three out of four weeks, I walked alone. My husband joined me for a week of it. Um, whether they walked alone um, whether they walked with a people that they met or they did it a combo of walking by themselves with talking with no one and then mm -hmm. met with people. Everyone uh, walked with their husband and picked up a, 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 a gaggle of college children <laughs> that became <laughs> that they were mentoring like every single person literally drinking throughout the whole thing. I mean, I've, I literally have seen all these different kinds of expressions and um, – and a, a profound sense of change that actually not only stays with people, but I do think what you're saying, it's like it stays with you and it perhaps evolves over time. Like my friend said, the thing that I learned about the Camino is about impermanence. She did this four years ago and she said, nothing stays. I would walk with people. I would walk with them for a full day and like learn about the depths of their soul, like almost more deeply connected than strangers that I've ever met. And then I would not see them again for the rest of my life. And so I learned about impermanence and that has actually taken me to all these great depths in life and just recognizing that. So it is very interesting because it did do all the things that you mentioned. Like I had this profound connection to earth and it was, and it was very interesting just the, the, the term is bon camino, which is like you do life your way. So there, and the way that I did it is, um, uh, as my walking partner described it, he said, you, we walked alone together. So we would walk together and I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't want to like talk about the day or the hostel that we stayed at or the food or my experiences or what I was thinking. I just wanted to be focused on the trees, nature, communing. And I, and because of my radio show, you know, I would be in the sun and I would imagine like connecting with the sun and the heat of the sun and, and imagine that the sun burning away all, you know, my negative karma or whatever, you, you, whatever someone would, that's at least my frame or the wind, like, you know, you know, everything I was communing with and, and uh, the thing that you mentioned happened, you know, I, I looked one day and I was walking and I'd see trees swaying in the wind and I would just start crying. It was just the beautiful magic of nature that somehow was always there, but I never really saw. Um, so I don't know. I had that <laughs> sense of it. Um, I mean, I, yeah. What do you, what are your thoughts that come up? Sometimes it takes a while to see what's right in front of us. Yeah. You know, I think that's a big lesson for me and uh, something that, um, you know, that I've noticed is that we, we do a practice in the school where we send folks out in the woods and they sit for about 45 minutes every morning at about 7 a.m. or 6.45 a.m. And they sit alone in the woods for 45 minutes and they just watch. And one of the amazing things about that practice is that, you know, I'll be sitting there for 30 minutes before I notice there's a little tree growing right in front of me. Mm. Right. You know, or I'll sit at my spot and it takes me days or weeks before I notice that there's a rock like right there, you know, like it's just, um, 
it takes time to see and experience and recognize what's ha- happening right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's just something really powerful um, that happens when we when we give ourselves the time and the space to be present. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and, and I think when that veil drops, like you described, you like I, you know, I've had that experience of really feeling like heaven on earth. Mm-hmm. Oh, like this is like our earth is a miracle. Mm-hmm. You know, trees are a miracle. I'm a, how everything is like amazing, right? How is all this here? You know, and how beautiful is it? You know, and um, you know, it's one of those things that I. That's one of the reasons why I feel like unstructured time for children is so important. Because they need to have those those long, boring stretches of sitting in the backyard with nothing to do so that they can start to see the wind in the trees and recognize the wonder of life on earth and carry that with them into the rest of their lives. And um, it, starts, it starts young, but we can always, but it's never too late. We can have those experiences when we get older too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's so much, you know, if you talk to Taoists, which I have, you know, that, you know, the whole Tao Te Ching, all, and you've talked to any Taoists, they just sit and watch, sit and watch in nature. And there's so much you can learn by just looking at that little tree, right? Or the rock that you didn't see before. It's like just watching it grow even, or how it grows, or how it curves around like the rock that is getting in its way of pa- like you know there's all these things that you can learn about nature yeah. but it takes all that time um you had mentioned i uh, um you talked about how you're taught by nature you're getting back to your roots um and then it reopened a conversation so i wanted to talk about those two pieces as we i know we only have three minutes but could you actually give me a sense of what those seem things mean getting back to your roots and reopening a conversation for you yeah. what does it mean yeah so uh for me like getting back to getting back to my roots is about um um just reconnecting with um what's essential mm-hmm. right so this is why like camping and getting out there is so good. And like what you did, like walking the Camino is so helpful. It's like, um, you know, what's essential to life, you know? And I think, um, connection with other people, like meaningful connections with other, uh, other human beings, um, you know, meaningful connections with nature, um, you know, nourishing food, you know, shelter, right. So shelter, food, water, like the basic essentials and connections with others and with nature and, um, and with meaning. And, you know, these are, you know, today, like so many folks are, um, you know, we're just, we're, we're cut off from our land. We're cut off from one another in some ways we're cut off from where our food comes from. And Mm -hmm. so when I wrote rewilding, part of it was about like, let's get reconnected with, um, what's essential. Let's get reconnected with what getting to know our land um, beginning to reestablish some kind of relationship with where our food comes from, whether that's, you know, gardening or foraging or hunting or whatever it might be, but to, you know, reestablish a little bit of that relationship with food and, um, and with others. And, um, the, uh, the opening, the conversation is about, um, something that I really do think has been lost to modern human beings and it, it does connect to the de-animating of, of nature. Um, you know, really all indigenous cultures that I've come across and researched um, see nature as animate. Um, you know, see the great elements and the trees and the stones and the other creatures, species that we're related to and share this earth with as um, animate, as alive, as sentient. Um, and... You know, in in the modern age, we've deanimated the earth. And in a sense, by doing that, we have um, kind of walked away from a conversation Mm. with our planet. Mm -hmm. And so what does a conversation look like? Um, You know, when when I go out into the forest and and I sit and I observe my land, um, you know, birds and foxes and trees and stones, um, you know, they become a part of my family. Mm. They become a part of my network. Mm. Um, and, you know, I practice, I will practice like just talking to the land. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, sometimes the land talks back. Yeah. Um, and that 
is a um, that's an experience that is life changing. Yeah. Um, and is uh, it changes one's relationship with oneself and the earth. Um, and I think that, you know, the earth is always speaking to us, mm-hmm. you know, when, when huge hurricanes are forming and moving across islands or peninsulas, like in a way, like that's the earth speaking, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And we can listen and pay attention, you know, or we can ignore those, mm-hmm. those words. Um, nature is always talking and, you know, right now we got a fresh snowfall here in the Berkshires on my way in this morning. So many tracks in the snow. Yeah. So many relatives in the more than human world speaking through, you know, the first written language with it, which is tracks in the snow. Yeah. Right? Footprints in the it. earth. I love it. Um, we have been talking to Michael Mortali about his book, We Wild. And could you hold up the book again? Oh, sure. Um, Meditations, Practices and Skills for Awakening in Nature. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great speaking with you and hearing about your uh, walk on the Camino (laughs) and all the other things we spoke about. Thank you, CJ. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.